Let's have a word of prayer as we come to the scripture, spend some time in it. Father God, we ask that you'll look upon us this morning as we read the scripture. And again we pray that the Holy Spirit, who is present, Lord, will reach down into the depth of our beings and open our eyes that we might see wonderful things from your law. Lord, that we might leave this place, Lord, having fellowshiped, Lord, with Christ, and knowing, Lord, that we have received this morning to take something to a sick and needy world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise God. Now, for those of you who are visiting this morning, I'll just tell you what we've been doing. For the last number of months, we have been going through the Old Testament and we have been looking for Jesus Christ in every book of the Old Testament. And praise God, he is there, abundantly. He is there. And last week, we were on the book of Obadiah and uh, we did speak about Jesus in the book of Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah is interesting because we see the lineage of the forever king coming through the seed of Jacob, not Esau. And we realize that Obadiah was a prophecy against Edom. But we see the hope of salvation. I must apologize. I do put the messages on the on the website and uh, when I checked it I realised that three times I talked about Jacob being the father when I should have been saying Esau was the father no wonder somebody said to me I was a wee bit confused sorry see I'm still confused so who did I say Esau Isaac was the father Isaac was the father so any contributions to the minister's holiday fund are welcome it's uh, what they call wear and tear Uh, anyway praise God uh, the, the promise came through Abraham, uh, through Isaac, and then through Jacob, and Obadiah shows us that. Now, we're now at the book of Jonah, which is a bit different. Um, it's not a, a messianic prophecy, but it's a very, very important prophecy in the book of Jonah. Let's just read it, shall we? We'll read chapter 2. Now, you probably know the book of Jonah. <laughs> The story, we'll be touching on the story uh, to refresh your mind. Uh, but here we have this, say, uh, the prayer of Jonah. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me, and all your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing water threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seawood was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. To those who cling to worthless idols, turn away from God's love for them. But I will, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say... Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Praise God for that message. I was just reading it. I was thinking about a man that used to come to this church, Johnny McCulloch. Um, Johnny's with the Lord now. He used to play the banjo. Remember Johnny? He used to sing that song, I'll Fly Away. And one day he did. He flew away to be with the Lord. And I remember Johnny telling his testimony. And Johnny... went for a swim in the Lily Lock in Airdrie and got into difficulties and nearly drowned. I remember in his testimony and he says as he was drowning his whole life came before him. 
That's part of his test me. I've got it on a tape if you want to see it. It's on a video. And I was just thinking about that as Jonah was sinking down to the depths of the sea eh, and his life was ebbing away. Eh, what he remembered. Praise God that even in moments like these, God's grace is still evident. Amen? Now, we'll talk about the story of Jonah, but I want to um, link us right away to what Jesus said. And uh, Matthew 12, uh, 38 to 41. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet, Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Praise God. Now here, when we look at this, what the Lord Jesus says, you know, we don't need to look far to connect the story of Jonah with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the story of Jonah is a sign that's given to a wicked and adulterous generation. The sign of the resurrection. You know, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul in Corinthians talks about if Christ not be not risen, we have believed in vain. <clears throat> You know, all of our faith stands on this reality that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I was listening to a man giving some Bible teaching. He was speaking to a Jewish lady and uh, he, was trying, he was speaking about Jesus being the Messiah and he talked about Jesus being alive and the Jewish lady said to him, if he's really alive, then he must be the Messiah. But how can I know if he's alive? And the man said to her, why don't you speak to him and ask him? The woman got converted because he is alive. Praise God. We shouldn't be frightened to tell people to speak to God because there's somebody listening. We cry to the Lord. The Bible says that those that call upon the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God for this wonderful prophetic sign that is in this story of the book of Jonah. Now the word Jonah means a dove. And um, that's interesting. Because there's a group coming here to use the premises next week to do some training. They're called Dove Christian Counseling. I just wondered if they'd get many candidates if they called themselves Jonah Christian Counseling. <laughs> eh? You wonder, because when we talk about people being a Jonah, they seem to think they're going to sink us, and one thing we don't want is to be sunk. Well, he was the son of Amateur of Gath Hepha. He was a prophet of Israel, and he predicted the restoration of the ancient boundaries. His ministry was in Israel. You know, it's funny how we get locked into what our remit is, don't we? His remit was to Israel. How do I know this? Well, Second Kings 14, I'll read it to you, verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat which had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Labo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. Now it was interesting, last week we were talking about how Edom came to nothing. It was absolutely annihilated. There are no Edomites today. But the Lord has never blotted out Israel. Even all their wickedness, 
and breaking of the covenant, he has a promise to them. And thank God that through his promise and through Judah, there came the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Praise God that the Lord has maintained his promise. So this man, Jonah, was a prophet. If we can divorce ourselves from the story of the man inside the whale for a minute and see a man who had a ministry. Interestingly enough, when he was called to go outside his comfort zone, and we often talk about this in this church, if we have a church are going to do anything for God, we have to be prepared to go outside our comfort zone. Sometimes we designate a line and I stay within these boundaries. And God often tells you, no, cross that boundary and see what I can do for you. You know, Abraham was told that. Get out of your land and go to your land that I will show you. It's interesting. You know, I had a wee experience yesterday, I'll talk about it. Now, the Ninevites were really strange, strange people. If you study ancient civilizations, they were really wicked, you know. Even the Romans. The Romans used to delight and gore. They used to love watching the blood coming from their victims. That's why they had all these blood sports and the, the gladiators and the, throwing them at the lions and all the rest of it. This was part of it. The Ninevites were worse. Apparently in the Ninevites, according to history, used to take their victims and they used to flay the skin off them. They were so evil. Isn't it terrible when you get a society that delights in hurting? And you just wonder where this society is going because we're so far away from where we should be as a society. Anyway, he was called to go to a people uh, that he didn't want to go to. And sometimes God wakes us up. I was just telling you a wee funny thing that happened to me yesterday. Uh, Eileen and I happened to be in the town for a reason. We'd been to visit somebody in hospital, plus we had the thing on in here. And uh, we went to get a, a, a one of the... Um, a lunch, and uh, when we'd had the lunch, uh, I looked at the bill, and there was a wee card, and the man's name was on the card as the manager of the place. And then when I looked at my phone later on, the same man's name came up, and uh, it was it was on Facebook, and it was reminding me it was his birthday today. I said, but I don't know that man. But that was the man that just served me my dinner. I'd know, I said, how have I got him on Facebook? And I thought, Oh, it's because he's a friend, a friend, a friend, and he must have asked it, and I, and I won't, a weakness I must have accepted. But we noticed on his window, it said, we feed the hungry here uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, I think it was, from such and such a time. This restaurant gives food to the homeless every week. And we were listening to um, Barnabas Fellowship, who were talking about how Islam is taking over the role of the church in this country. What the church used to do, Islam is now doing. This man's name is Muhammad. And uh, I thought, you know, I wonder why he wanted to connect with a Christian pastor. I said, well, these things work two ways. Maybe, how many of us would be prepared to go and witness to Muslim people? Is that outside our remit? Think about it. When's the last time you witnessed to a Muslim? Have you ever witnessed to a Muslim? Well, Jonah was told to go and witness to Ninevites and he was having none of it. My job is with the people I've been given to where it works. I was told to reset the boundaries. And it's something to do with boundaries that we have problems. God sets the boundaries and the prophecy came to pass. And God will set your boundaries. Anyway... Jonah was a man who exercised this ministry in the reign of Jeroboam II. And probably a contemporary with Hosea and Amos. Maybe he was before them, I'm not sure. Some suggest it was writ written round about 760 years before Christ came. His, his history is very interesting. He is a missionary to the heathen in Nineveh. And also as a type of the Son of Man. Jesus refers to that. The Apostle Peter, you know, he was named, uh, known as Simon, son of Jonah. Is that right? Did you know that? So obviously in his family there was a Jonah. Uh, you know, Peter used to say things he later regretted. 
But that was, so obviously this man was of note, and Simon, who became Peter the Rock, was the son of Jonah. Praise God. A, a name that had been taken from, a, we take Christian names, they must have taken a prophet's name. Now, but in God's grace, Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, but the grace of God was still pursuing him. He was angry. He was given something he didn't want to do. He didn't want to share about a gracious and merciful God to certain sinners. He only wanted nice sinners, okay? They didn't deserve it. And, but he eventually, through after an interlude, where he was three days down in the mouth, if you know what I mean, he changed his mind. And sometimes God's got to take us a hard, rough passage before we change our mind. And God was used to save and turn to God a whole people. And when God did it, Joseph was furious. He was furious. So, praise God that Jesus is quite different from Jonah. Jonah was sent on a mission and it was a struggle to get him to go on with it. Jesus... He humbly followed his father's will. Is that right? He did his father's will. And he shared his heart for the lost. And enough to give his life to save them. The son of man has come to give his life a ransom for many. Praise God. So, a lot of people, when you talk about Jonah, the first thing, thing they think about is being swallowed by a whale. I remember when I was converted at 14 years of age and I went to Scripture Union a Church of Scotland minister came in and wanted to encourage us. And this Church of Scotland minister, he uh, said, um, he began to explain to me that I really shouldn't believe the Bible. You know, I really shouldn't believe it because a lot of it, I mean, the Word of God is in it, but it's, a lot of it's fable and myth and all the rest of it and talked about Jonah and the whale. Remember the story of Billy Bray? He said, do you believe that, do you believe that, uh, that Jonah was in the belly of a whale? And, and Billy Bray said, why, if the word of God said that Jonah swallowed a whale, I would believe it. Praise God for faith. Amen. Well, let's have a wee talk about this. Because for a lot of people, it is a stumbling block. Uh, if you're talking to non-Christians, you say, there's no way somebody could be swallowed by a whale. Do you know that sometimes whales swallow their prey whole? Right? It's a biological fact uh, that... Uh, they can swallow a whole squid whole. And uh, a man could definitely fit down their esophagus. And uh, they could manage a human no problem. In fact, there is a story of a sailor being swallowed by a sperm whale off the Falkland Islands. Do you know about this story? Uh, well, it's uh, recorded by the British... It's in the records of the British Admiralty. And it's uh, marked up, this story. In 1891... Two small whale boats from the British vessel, the Star of the East, were lowered into the waters of the Falkland Islands, 500 kilometres east of Argentina. That's around about, is that near where the, the Logos sank? No. <laughs> no, no, it was Chile they sank next day, but praise God. Right, so, now, there was, um, there was they'd sighted a huge sperm whale. There were crew members, James Bartley, 21. He watched as the harpoon met its mark. And when the, the, the whale had been harpooned, it, it, uh, it dived 250 metres. And then the line went slack. Now remember, these fellows are out in small boats. They've come off. This is way back in uh, 1891. That's how they did it. They did it from small boats and then they would drag it onto the the mother boat. Suddenly, eh, there was a, spl a splashing and the, whole, the whale burst up from the water and it smashed one of the boats. And two of its crew were missing. Everyone else was rescued, but two of them were missing. One of the missing was this man called James Bartley. And eh, they got the whale and they winched it onto the ship with the, the harpoon uh, in line that had met its mark. And when they, it resurfaced, they noticed that there was movements in its stomach. And so they started to cut, cut open the gut. 
Out came a boot and a trousered leg. And there was James Bartley. Now he'd been in the belly of the whale for 15 hours. Uh, his skin had been bleached white with the gastric juices of the, of, the, of the whale. His hair had fell out. He was nearly blind. And for two weeks he was delirious. And it was only after a month he could tell how he'd fallen into the whale's mouth. He felt his teeth grate over him as he slid down its throat into its stomach. Now that man lived for another 18 years after that, and uh, that's the record, that, uh, so it can be done, a man can be swallowed by a whale. Apparently before diving, a sperm whale inhales deeply and rapidly stores oxygen in its muscle fibres and tissues and blood. Could it be that James Bartley survived through the storing up of such oxygen? So, when they hit you with a, a man can't get swallowed by a whale, I'll tell you something, the Bible says the Lord prepared a great fish. This was no special, this was a special uh, vessel to uh, move his prophet to where he was supposed to be. The other thing is that if you listen carefully to the reading which I read, it said, Jonah cried from the realm of the dead. Did you notice that? From the realm of the dead... I cried. Now, I met one woman once who came back to life. She had been knocked down by a car. She was put in a mortuary, and she lay in the mortuary for a while. And in the meantime, her sister was crying to God, asking God to give the, the, the girl back. She was a child when it happened. And a nurse went into the mortuary for some reason and saw her body moving. And she would rush back in and resuscitated. Now her story to me was, and I spoke to this woman, was she felt herself holding on to a hand that would not let her go. A lot of things about the realm of the dead we, we don't know about. Uh, we, we, we hear stories, but one day we'll know about it because we'll be there. We will pass through that veil. There are certain theologians believe actually that Jonah was dead inside the belly of the whale. Just like Jesus was dead inside the tomb. Now, I don't know for sure whether he was just held in a term kind of suspended animation. But don't let this people put you off about this story. Who could forget a man spending three days inside the belly of a sea monster? So if we could move on from it, because basically the fish story is a, really a bit of a red herring and what we're trying to get to, if you don't mind the pun. Uh, there is a bigger picture of what Jonah is all about. Jonah is about the sovereign control of God over worldly affairs. And we know that because he sent Jesus Christ, and this is a sign to an adulterous nation. It's about a need to repent of selfishness and hypocrisy. It's about God's love and grace. Praise God. Every book in the Old Testament eh, has a main focus. And we know that main focus is the salvation of God. Hallelujah. And Jonah points to the person and work of this, this Saviour, Jesus Christ. And seeing Jesus Christ in the Old Testament book of Jonah helps us to understand uh, how Jesus could refer to himself as someone greater than Jonah is here. He knew that he would be swallowed up by death. But on the third day, hallelujah, he would rise. And by the way, that is our gospel. Remember all when it preached to his pulpit. He used to give him gospel tracts. He said, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading them to make sure they are gospel tracts. I said, what do you mean? He says, because the gospel must tell people about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And sometimes our gospel tracts tell them all sorts of things about Jesus, but they don't mention the fact that our salvation is in what Jesus Christ did on the cross and defeating hell, death and the grave rose from the grave. And that is the part of the gospel. So he said, if it's not in your gospel tract, it's not really a gospel tract. So I've always started reading the tracts since Alwyn told me that. But praise God, there are some great messages that point people to the gospel. But why not just give them the gospel? Hallelujah. 
Praise God. So Jonah was a prophet preaching a message of repentance. Now, we know that he fled from the Lord, but praise God, by the end of the book, he did what he was told to do. He was told to go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness had come up before the Lord. And he ran away, but the word of the Lord came back to him the second time, and this time he proclaimed, repent, repent. He obeyed the Lord. Now, Nineveh was a big, big city. According to the book of Jonah, it took three days to walk across it. Apparently, it's situated in, near the city of Mozo in Iraq. It's the uh, east bank uh, of the Tigris River. And it's huge and thoroughly evil. Now, in actual fact, Jonah doesn't tell us about the sins of Nineveh. It doesn't really explain what they were. Some of the prophets would tell you what their sins were. Like Isaiah would talk about the faulty balance and the idolatry. But we know that it was a very wicked city. The only references to their wickednesses were the king's command, after responding to Jonah, that they turn away from the violence that is in their hands. So it must have been a very violent city, a wicked, evil, violent city. Now, Jonah preached to the people repentance, and Jesus Christ preached a message of repentance. Read, read the book of Mark. It starts off, Jesus Christ came in the power of the Spirit, preaching the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Jonah ran away from the call of God that God gave him. But praise God, our perfect saviour, our perfect prophet, Jesus, obeyed perfectly the Father's will and went all the way to the cross. Thank God for Jesus that he did the will of the Father. Jonah slept on a ship during a storm and the storm was caused by his own disobedience but he offered up his life to save those on the ship. You know the story? He said to the people, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. Throw me off the boat. Uh, they were all saying to him, pray to your God. Whose fault is this? Is that the way they thought in those days? He offered up his life to save those on the ship. Jesus slept on a ship during a storm. He calmed the storm and later he offered up his life to save those who were disobedient. How wonderful is our saviour. Praise God. Jonah claimed to fear the creator God who had authority on earth. Jonah 1 verse 9. He feared the creator God. Jesus is the creator God. What we read in John, he said he was in the world, the world was made by him. And the world... He did not know him. Matthew 28, 18 says, Then Jesus came to him and said, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. That's what Jonah wouldn't do. He wouldn't go to all nations, just some nations. Or some nation as it was. But God has authority in Jesus Christ, given all authority to his Son. Jonah spent three days inside of the belly of a great fish because of his own sin. And Jesus spent three days inside the belly of the earth because of our sin. Praise God. Jonah knew that salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah 2 verse 9. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listen to my cry. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Praise God. Jesus' name means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. Jesus means saviour. And he's the only source of salvation. Jonah says salvation comes from the Lord. And Jesus is the Lord who brings salvation. Praise God. He becomes the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And that was preached by the early apostles in the book of Acts. If you want the references, I'll give them to you. We read it in Hebrews 8 and 9. There's only one name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. Jonah despised God for showing grace towards repentant sinners. Is that right? He wasn't happy when God spared them. He wanted them blotted out. You ever feel like that? I actually heard a man say, I'll not see who it was and what the situation was, because some of you will know what I'm talking about. But a certain 
place shut down in Glasgow that had been a, a centre of the gospel for a long time and I, I happened to be there for a reason doing a job and a man who had been involved with that work said to me I'm looking forward to the judgment day when the people responsible for this will answer. I said, well, where's the grace of God? Where's the grace of God? This was a man who was angry because this place had shut down and he wanted God to deal with him. Is that the kind of God you serve? Thank God Jesus Christ did. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. None of us deserve salvation. How, who are we to think? Know that it would be okay for us if God were to look into his heart and see the malice and anger, is that not a sin? Jonah despised God for showing grace towards sinners. Jesus demonstrated God's grace towards repentant sinners. Amen. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. Jonah did not have concern for the salvation of people from other nations. Jesus loved the world so much that he gave his life to ransom people to God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelations 5 and 8. Praise God. John 3.16. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. Jonah was angry enough to die because of God's grace towards sinners. Remember when he, he was under the, the gourd and he, it wilted and he was angry. He, he wanted to die. But Jesus was compassionate enough to die because of his love for sinners. How sad the human heart is. Amen. That God can redeem us and change us and make us like Christ. Jonah cared about a plant that, 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 made, that gave him comfort. Jesus cared about the lost enough to deny himself comfort. Is that right? The Bible says the Son of Man had no way to lay his head. In order to reconcile them to God, he became as a man and a man of lowly estate. If anyone here, we read in Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new cre creation. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Are you carrying the message of reconciliation? So I'm bringing our message to a close. We just have to face up to some questions. Are you like Jesus or are you like Jonah? Do you think things or do you first time obey the will of God? Do you share God's heart for the lost? Or are you reluctant to lead people to faith in Christ? If you find yourself like Jonah, <coughs> you're not alone. It's part of the human condition, isn't it? But thank God he's changing us all. And we don't want to be cold in our evangelism. We don't want to lose our burden. We talked about that the other week. With the prophet, his name meant burden. Was that Amos? God's slowness to anger and amazing grace. Praise God. Lord, make me less like Jonah and more like Jesus. Save me from being the kind of person who cares more about my comfort, my reputation and my success than I do about the people you are calling me to serve. Help me to keep all my aspirations on your altar and be ready at all times to respond when faith and obedience to your call is required. Lord, bless us as we close our service and help us to take something from this, the reality of the fact that Lord, you gave that sign to the lost that you would rise from the dead. Encourage us in our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.